I keep looking down. I don't know if you need to put, put my wheel on right. It's been bugging me all day. Um, diagnosing. Are we going? Are we doing flats tonight? <laughs> yeah. All wheel wheel works is is all night after. Yeah. yeah. Is when? After diagnosing problems. Okay. Should we go to diagnosing problems? What problems? My bike's not guess, shifting. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like I guess we kind of we'll, we'll kind of cover out. Okay. Really, a really common one. Um, that will happen in all types of bikes is where the bike shifts okay, but every once in a while, about every second pedal, pedal revolution, you'll feel like your cranks slip and then all of a sudden they catch and re-engage. And, and sometimes it's a wear problem where you like if your bike has lots of kilometers, you're, depending on the size of the, the cogs and stuff, they'll wear it at different speeds and your chain. So if your chain's stretched out, it no longer meshes well with either your front or your, with some of your rear gears, especially if you cruise at a certain comfortable speed and you do most of your mileage in that one gear back here, that'll usually wear out. And then if it skips, usually if you're pedaling really hard and it skips, but otherwise it shifts fine, usually that's an indication of wear. So something in your drivetrain is worn out. But that other one where it shifts okay, but you'll, it'll, every once in a while it'll slip and then catch. You have to take a really good look at your chain. If you look down at your chain, make sure that it's not twisted. If it's twisted, you can you can see easily that it's twisted. And then if that's the case, replace your chain. The other one that's really common though is it'll have one bad link. And sometimes it's the link that was joined at the factory. And um, if it's a stiff link, when you pedal backwards, you'll actually see it go through your derailleur like a lump. And um, when it comes out here, it'll be sticking up like that, a little bit, actually the other way, but no, you'll see one link just doesn't, and then you can grab that link and feel it, yeah, this particular chain it has a, a master link right there, so it, it uh, can come apart right there. For tomorrow, will we get to learn how to change those? Oh yeah. Okay, because yeah. I know when we have those little yeah. tools in our bags, yeah, they come with a couple toilet. little links, but I've never known how to change it. Anyhow. So one, one thing, if your chain does have that stiff link, uh, you need a chain tool. There's a bunch of different ones. I'll pass this one around. But all of the better quality ones will have two sets of these, these bumps. I'll just pass that around. This is the same thing. That one is for really thick BMX chains, and this one is for... Um, most of your seven to nine speed chains, six to nine speed. Can you open my toolbox? I have some small pieces of chain on the left side at the back, just spare pieces. Way better than sharing on the bike. Yep, yeah, perfect. Okay, so. Say this link here, that one right there, is my stiff link. Actually, I can, I'll make it stiff. Oh, not enough. Okay, say that's my stiff link. So something's got in there, or you've got a, sometimes you'll get a little rock that gets caught in between the actual chain ring and the the chain and that can actually deform the end of the plate. If that happens, if you can see it's like physically deformed, um, take it to the shop or get the link and change out that complete link yourself. So if this was a stiff link, a uh, really bad thing to do is I've seen lots of people do that and I've seen some articles that say to do it is grab your chain and then go like this really hard and just try to work that link out. Sometimes it'll work that link out but what problem is it loosens off the, every link for two or three links on either side of it and that allows dirt and grit to get into those links and seize them up and it's like a vicious cycle it'll just ruin your chain. But if you have the chain break with the second series of bumps here, take your stiff link and I'm just going to push that pin in until it sticks out a little bit more on that side than the pin side. So all I'm doing is pushing the, the pin just partially through the chain. Just 
just so it sticks up on that side. Then I take my same, you can see that that link is stiff now, it sticks up. And I, obviously it's on the bike so I don't turn the chain around, I turn the, the tool around. And usually it's a good idea to work on it down here where you've got some room. Now I do the same thing and I push it through. Just a tiny, tiny bit past center, just barely. And you can kind of, as you're doing it, you can see you've gone past center. Just so that time. pushes the chain back. So I, what I've done by pushing it that way, turning the tool around, pushing it, I've, uh, I've tightened all those plates together really tight. Okay. So you push it one way, then turn the tool around. The pin on. that goes between those is one solid piece, or is yeah, it it's between your piece. locking pieces? Okay. No, it's one piece. Okay. Yeah. So now I've pushed that past center and I've all been using this front set of these bumps here right by this big mass mm -hmm. and now I'll use the second one back here and that's not supported by this. So I turn my tool around again and I just push that enough that I can see the pin move. Not quite enough. And what that does is it compresses everything together and then when you push it back just a tiny bit, then it gives you that free play in your links. And a lot of times if you just have one stiff link and you do that process where you push it one way, push it the other way, then you use the second set of bumps just to put some play in there, it'll fix it. And yet it does nothing to the links directly adjacent to the one that was giving you problems. You if, you have, have, if you have a stiff link, what's it feel like when you're riding? It, when you're riding, it'll, it'll slip, like all of a sudden you, oh, you don't have power, and then it catches. Okay. And it'll do it about every one and a half to two and a half pedal strokes. Okay. And uh, usually that's an indication of a stiff link. Your other thing, uh, common problems, is your bike was uh, shifting perfectly and uh, your bike fell over in the garage even onto the, onto the drive side and all of a sudden your shifting is noisy or you can't get one gear. Sometimes it'll just bend that so you're one gear <coughs> over. So it'll shift fine and all of a sudden your derailleur is trying to go into your spokes. Or like loading in your, in, into your car and then and you, you kind of... You whack your derailleur on you, something. Yeah, you whack your derailleur. It's very common. Yeah. So as long as this hanger is straight when the bike was new um, these, your high and your low screws on the back here, those never need to be adjusted. And those are called limit screws. One limits how far your derailleur can go towards the outside to the frame, and the other screw limits how far the derailleur can travel in towards your spokes. And they're marked with H and L. Low, your low gear is always in towards the center of your frame, front and rear, and your high gear is always towards the outside of your frame. So if you ever see H and L on your derailleurs, you know Lowest to the inside, highest to the outside, always, always. But those are set up when the bike is new, and as long as nothing's ever been bent, those never need to be adjusted. Unless you, you know, you're installing a new derailleur mechanism. So, I, we had an issue last year when I was riding, and it would, it's the rear derailleur, and it would click every once in a while, like, yeah. You, um, and I think that's where we we're mucking around with those limit screws a little bit. Yeah. But I think it turned out that would also indicate yeah. that that derailleur or the hanger was bent a little bit. Is that right? Could have been. Yeah. yeah. Um, One a really common thing with tri bikes because you have those if you've got your shifters on the end of your mm -hmm. bar extensions, because that's such a huge path for that cable to go. If there's any, if there's a little kink near the end of one of these housings, if there's any drag points in that cable and housing anywhere, when you go to you, you pull the shift in the low gear, so you're adding tension to the system. It shifts perfect, but when you go to shift back towards your higher gears, it starts doing weird stuff. Usually that's an indication that there's drag somewhere in the system. So you're pushing it down and it's, it's not hesitating. all going... Okay, yeah, yeah, or it'll take like an extra three pedal strokes yeah. and then clunk. And usually that's an indication of there's a kink somewhere or there's some drag. And then we have to take each little piece off and inspect it. And then sometimes when you can find it, you end up changing a brand new inner cable and all new housing just so you know, just to eliminate that sure. possibility. And that's a common one with tri-bikes because 
that path is so so, long. so far to your derailleur. On the rear, not, not so much on the front. And then if there's any changes, you've changed your uh, gear. You've changed your front gear because you want one tooth bigger because you find you, you need that for, or you're, you're spinning out in your very top gear and you've got, you know, you're spinning so fast, your cadence is so high, you need, need a bigger gear. If you change that, then this derailleur has to go up to give you clearance, so that has to be your adjusted. This bolt on this side, this is just a clamp that holds onto the frame. Some of your frames will have a tab welded or built right into the frame structure, and then your front derailleur has a curved piece that fits into that, and then that would be adjusted here. This one's a hybrid of the two. This, this derailleur style is the brazon style, but it has a clamp, so it's kind of a, a bit of both. Um, this outer part of your derailleur cage if you're standing above your bike looking straight down, this outer part of your cage should be perfectly parallel to your chain ring. It shouldn't be at an angle. And then the distance here, um, I don't have one of those stickers on the floor, usually that's a full There's one a right sticker here. usually comes on the derailleur, right here, and it shows you the gap that it's supposed to be between your cage and your teeth of your derailleur. So it's only about uh, a millimeter. And that usually comes right on the derailleur. And then when it's assembled, you pull those off. A like, good trick that I was shown is uh, you use a, a penny and as a feeler gauge. That's about the same. The same thickness as that? About the same thickness. And you just drop it and right, on, right down it onto your penny. In between your oh, okay. derailleur cage and the tallest tooth you can yeah. find. At the closest point, which There's on this would be uh, right there at the front. Yeah. One, if you're working on your own bike, especially on carbon stuff, um, a really important tool is a uh, torque wrench. Because, especially on stuff like your, your handlebar bolts, if these aren't, um, if they're too loose, you put too much weight on your bars, also your bars suddenly move, that's a huge safety issue. And this one is the worst because you steer your bars and your wheels stay straight. Um, if this was loose. So then the torque wrench and usually there's um, especially on your higher carbon bikes a lot of times the uh, it'll have the torque value stamped right into there. It'll say like 10 to 12 newton meters. It'll say right on the part. For these ones your typical conventional uh, barn stem these bolts are 100 uh, inch pounds. Here. And these are really easy to use. Maybe I'll do it this way so you can see better. Got to make sure this is as deep as it'll go. You got to make sure you can see where it's going. And that actually wasn't torqued. So I'm just going really slow until I can see that indicator line go right up to the 100 newton meter mark. And your, um, there's a couple of resources online. What's public? Is Barnett's Torque Specs public? I don't know. Uh, you can, there's resources on there. You could put like bicycle stem actually, torque values. I think the UBI torque chart is yeah. uh, United Bicycle Institute. It's bikeschool.com. Yeah. Uh, and that's a good place to go. For Most the stuff these days have, have it printed right on. Especially the for the smaller ones. Like uh, yeah. this. these are five millimeter. The thread size is 6 millimeter. your tool size is 5 mil, but a lot of them have the smaller bolt that's the same size as your water bottle bolt, which has a very small thread, and those are all 5 newton meters, which is really, um, because the threads are so small, it's uh, really not that tight. And you definitely, if you have an Allen key like this, and you're going to tighten one of those, and they're really easy to strip because you have a steel bolt and aluminum threads and the threads are very tiny. This is a different style of torque wrench. So it works great for the lower values so it's just like a knob on the end of the handle and it's in increments of 0 to uh, 1.8 or 1.6 and you select the value for the bolt that you're going to tighten 
and once it reaches that value, Mark, can you grab me a six by one? It just kind of clicks, clicks into place. Okay. Yes. The head of the wrench just kind of pivots from side to side. And uh, so. so there's the two sizes I'm talking about. You can see the difference in the size of the, the actual thread. That just makes that click sound. So some years later, the lighter components will have at the, right value the smaller bolt, stop and that's the one that can't be torqued very much. These are generally fairly expensive. The beams are inexpensive, but... Nanooka McCoop sells one, I think, for like $25. Yeah, um, I think Princess Honda does as well. Oh, I suppose. Yeah. Um, Do we have one that, yeah, this is a really this cool one. Preset, oh, preset yeah. to five uh, newton meters are about 50 inch pounds, but it only comes with a four millimeter bit. So, Which matches the smaller of those two bolts, and usually four, that smaller bolt, if it's, you're with a stem, that's the torque value. For handlebars and stems, it works really well. Yeah, and how much is that? This one's 25. Um, it's great to uh, throw in your bag of tools if you're boxing your bike up a mm -hmm. lot and having to remove your bars. That's a, that's a very good one to have. The other thing is if you have a, a, carbon, a carbon seat post is you should never have uh, grease inside your frame because grease can attack uh, the bonding agents that, that hold the carbon fiber together. And what's the proper name for the stuff, the grit? Fiber grit. Fiber grit? Or, uh, fiber grit? Yeah. Carbon assembly compound. Yeah, and it's... it's uh, so does it feel like a grease but it's just different? Yeah, I know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you guys can pass this around if you want to feel the hunt. Oh, it's yeah, it's all top right there. Yeah. So that stuff is just to make, if you have carbon versus carbon, say you have a carbon handlebar and a carbon stem, and that union between the two, you want to get as much friction as possible, because carbon tends to be hugely... Well, I think like on my seat, right? The seat yeah. post is carbon and the frame is carbon? I'm yeah. sure there's something... Yeah. yeah. You don't want grease, you want that stuff, and that stuff increases friction so that as you're riding, your seat's not yeah, slowly creeping down because okay. the carbon components are so nicely finished, they're very smooth. Okay. And especially your junction of your, your handlebar and your stem, your stem and your steer tube, you definitely don't That's want any movement, pretty. any I'm movement there. To touch it. That also prevents uh, carbon from bonding to other carbon you get. Um, your sweat is really bad for doing that, but you actually kind there's of a, there's a the surfaces of the, uh, the epoxy on that side. Oh, the okay. so you get your like seat post stuck in your frame, that can be very, very hard. So that should be placed between any carbon carbon yeah. components. Yeah. Oh, and, and for your seat, if you have a carbon seat post that's yeah. round between your carbon oh, and aluminum, yeah, right. yeah, carbon yeah. aluminum as yeah. well. Any, any carbon surface, so, and you can use it. Uh, Just because you want to inhibit well. movement between, especially any sort of handlebar stem, steer tube, and seat post. You don't want that stuff. Once it's set, you want it to, to stay set. Very important to find out your torque value of um, your seat post clamp, especially on your, your higher end tri bikes, because most of your components are, are very thin, uh, usually carbon. And it's quite easy if that's over torqued that you're actually causing some structural damage to the carbon. You're compressing it. Like when uh, hockey players have the carbon sticks, they flex the stick and then somebody slashes their stick and it just explodes. Some idea, it's, it's kind of putting a stress riser in that material. To check drivetrain for wear, uh, a really easy way is to look at if you've been riding your bike quite a bit, you can look, this is a brand new bike, and you can see kind of the, how deep the tip of the, the tooth is there, like how long the flat surface is on top. And as you ride that bike, especially in your favorite gears, you can look in there and you can see that the tips of these teeth here are going to be skinnier than these ones down here. And, and also it'll get kind of like a, a shark fin effect where it has a curved part on the back side of the tooth 
and almost hit hooks backwards. And you'll see some where the uh, material's kind of deformed and there'll be little flat sides building up on the, on the drive side. Another way to check, a simple way to check without tools for wear. You've, you've been riding this bike a lot. You think your, your chain may be starting to skip a little bit when you pedal really hard. Just grab your chain when it's on about your middle chain ring or your small chain ring on a road bike if it's just two rings. And just grab with your fingertip and pull it forward. And you can see that only moves a couple of millimeters. When your chain is really wore, you do that and you can actually see that the tip of your, there'll be light between those. And it's like it's held fast here, it's held fast here, and that just kind of measures, a simple way to measure how well that's meshing. If you guys want to see a really worn out chain, Mark has one here, and I'm not sure where, I think it's just off He's concert. bending it sideways, he should not be able to do that. <laughs> and it's so worn out, the metal's so worn out on the edges, that you can go almost on the place. We've had it kept in the day room. A perfectly, like a brand new chain, you'll never be able, be able to do even close to that. Yeah. 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 So how long, like, are you talking like three seasons or one season or like? Yeah, it, I find like good thing. One rule that like, my instructor told us was is that you may just an inexpensive change is just change your chain every season. Yeah, it's a great like, way uh, Shimano to says fifteen. There is a, a fifteen hundred miles. Yeah. Okay. Uh, which isn't very much. But That's it's probably it's just now, steel and then your cost at how fast will that wear? Yeah. And then you flex um, that until it it'll doesn't It'll wear move. out and a lot faster if you don't change How your chain. much your how chain has much, stretched yeah. from new. Uh, so once, once a season is a, is a pretty good one. This is a brand new bike. And we'll put it another in Another thing that, and we'll that see. people do to like extend that. the life of their drivetrain is use two or three different chains a season. And... It's so tight it won't go in. <laughs> okay, that's brand new. Where's the old chain? Here. Uh, Use this one. This is more than one. Oh, yeah, this is perfect. Sorry. This is a chain checker tool made by Park. Oh, yeah, that just buries. So it's not even, it's beyond the range of this tool. So this is just checks. Um, because this chain is brand new, it won't quite fit in there. If you probably had a couple hundred K on it, it would be able to drop in between the rollers. And that just has this little window here. And you just flex this until it stops. And then there's numbers, I'll just pass this around. And that tells you it's kind of a go, no go, or it's acceptable wear and then too much wear and you have to re replace Todd, it. Todd, it's usually 5,000 kilometers per cassette on, on paper. But well, that, I'm sorry, I'm thinking miles. More miles? miles? Okay. Okay. Well, there's there's so many other factors. Yeah, like, but if you if you're for people that ride in wet conditions, it hugely accelerates your. And what about our yeah, What about our yeah. three then? Like our so grit around here, like every road bike you go out and ride, you got yeah. dust and dirt and like. And it, de it depends yeah. on how often the, the rider cleans their drivetrain. Mm -hmm. If somebody's really into Ever? Uh, cleaning <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, degreasing and then relubing their chain. Uh, some guys get amazing mileage out of uh, drive trains. But the guys that commute in the winter, they're... Uh, and also as, as the, the component groups are going, now almost everything's 10 speed, your, your rollers on your chain, your cogs are getting thinner and thinner and thinner. If you take a 175 pound racer that, that rides tons of miles, they'll wear out their chains pretty fast. Just because that load has to go over such a small area now. The, the price of having more gear selection is a little bit reduced uh, drivetrain life. So replacing your chain once a year is a good thing then? Yeah, yeah definitely almost good necessary. Um, Here, I'll give you that. Close Mark's toy. Wall, <laughs> Did that tool make it all the way? I can keep that. It's the show. I'm working it. But a real simple way is just to visually inspect, like look at the, the tips of the teeth here and see if the, if the middle ones are worn different than the outside ones. And just to do that trick is to pull it away from here. Also look, look down the chain for like twisting the chain or if you sometimes something will get caught and you'll actually have uh, these plates can crack. And I've seen them where the chain's almost coming apart and you know, it'll just feel terrible when you're riding, but it's only in that one spot. 
So you have to kind of turn your chain a bit, visually inspect it, turn it a bit, and just keep looking and make sure there's nothing um, stiff link or broken link or just uh, twisting in the chain itself. If you've ever had a chain that's dropped down in your frame, whether it's back here or up here, so as you're pedaling something, the force of that can catch the chain and really twist it. In a, in a pinch, can you ride with, um, like say you had a, a chain that broke on a race, and you have that little tool and you can push the pin out, can you ride yeah. in a race with one link short? Yep, you just can't ride uh, big, the bigger chain ring and then into your bigger okay. cogs here. Okay. Because you run the risk of turning your derailleur past its capacity. Oh, okay. One thing that happens once in a while too, as you, your derailleur gets older, this spring starts to, starts to deaden a bit the return spring that holds it up and sometimes they get this effect <laughs> the brakes on full time <laughs> why is it so hard to tell? Um, and sometimes, oh I have to adjust oh, that a... that was the sound of the derailleur trying to go into the spoke but sometimes they get this sound oh. and uh, what that is is as this derailleur ages and the spring deadens is it's not giving enough clearance here between the top of the derailleur pulley and the big cog here and it's binding and that's what this weird screw way back there that goes up against your derailleur hangers with that's called the B-tension screw and if I screw that in it'll just slowly push this derailleur out and that'll give me the clearance. But That's usually if the derailleurs really worn. That's more of a mountain bike thing that that happens and sometimes touring bikes if you have lots and lots of miles it'll start making that sound and you'll see it when you pedal. And you just screw that V-tension screw in and that pushes that away and that runs nice and quiet and smooth. Yeah, so it's just basically pushing up against the bottom part of your hanger and moving oh, okay. the so that's what uh, contacting the frame. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Quarter after eight. This is just a commercial or a chain home chain cleaner. So there's there's a park makes a couple.